Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Well, I've lived in Fargo County for three years, even more than three years, and I have yet to see a bear. I mean, I can't believe it. Everybody I know has seen a bear. Well, actually, I learned this morning some people have not seen a bear. But everybody, we have visitors come, and they saw a bear on the road, and my wife has seen bears, and my neighbors have seen loads of bears, and they're all around. I haven't seen a bear. I mean, I know they live right near us. We live surrounded by forest and field. Um, they leave their signs behind with deposits on the front yard, and um, we have our cat food container on the front porch, and a uh, bear actually open it up. I mean, the, the, the bang prints are in the, they're in the container. I mean, there are bears there. I just haven't seen any. I can't believe it. Because I like bears. In fact, the bear is one of my totems. I have an emotional connection to bears. Well, several years ago, Joanne and I were, were in Yellowstone National Park. We were there for 10 days. And we were getting a few things together for our first hike. Uh, we were at the general store. And the clerk said to us, have you got bear repellent? I said, well, how much does it cost? And he said, uh, $80. I said, $80? That's a lot of money for a can of spray. And he said, well, it is, unless you encounter a bear. <laughs> so we bought the spray, and we did see a grizzly bear. It was in a part of the park that had had a fire a few years earlier, and it was more gray and brown than green, even though it was a summer. And at the same time, Joanne and I saw this, this figure going across the trail, only about 100 feet down the trail. And uh, we knew it was a grizzly. And uh, we were right there in the middle of the trail. And Joanne said softly, man, don't stop. Well, I didn't stop. I, I kept walking. I mean, very carefully. I mean, I was fascinated. And then I heard this. She stomped her foot down. She said, Randolph, when I say stop, I mean stop. <laughs> <laughs> so I stopped. Bears are genetically programmed to wait. I mean, that's how they are built. And it's really a fascinating thing. I, the, the amount of time they spend in the hibernation depends on how cold and long the winter is, of course. It can be from four to seven months. And, but uh, how their body sort of comes close to shutting down is amazing. I mean, think of the evolution that had to take place in order for the bear to survive the winter because there was no food available for bears to eat during that time. Um, so they wait in, in hibernation in order to live. Um, and it's interesting that in um, American Indian, Native American lore, the bear <coughs> is symbolic of um, strength, that makes sense, of courage, and of healing. And I don't even know why those three characteristics are attached to the bear. I mean, strength I get as a, as a big animal. But um, I wonder, I wonder sometimes if the fact that the bear not only is active in order to live, but also in weights physically for a significant piece of time, I wonder whether that was sort of connected to this idea of healing and even of courage. Again, it's survival, but again, strength, courage, and healing. That's the rhythm of hibernation and waiting for bears. So, okay, so that's bears. What about the gospel? Well, John the Baptist was a bear of a guy. I mean, you've got to agree with that. I mean, he, he ate insects and honey. He, uh, he wore animal skin, not a bear skin, but a camel, a camel skin. Uh, he lived in the wilderness. I mean, he was, he was strange. He was, you know, certainly considered strong and courage, and I, I guess healing too. But he was a force with which to 
contend. And he preached fiercely, fiercely about repentance and about the coming Messiah. He had followers, he had disciples, and he was baptizing them with water. Um, in today's gospel, he's in prison, and, and not for criminal activities, but for political reasons. He had upset Herod. He had upset the political forces that existed in that area, and so he was jailed. Later, he was beheaded. And while he was still, while he was in prison, that's where this gospel picks up. When John heard in prison that the Messiah, what the Messiah was doing, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? That's the key in this whole gospel, I think. He sent his disciples, who had not been waiting as long as he had in order to understand who Jesus was, who had maybe some more needs in order to mature their spiritual understanding of who this prophet, this teacher, this preacher was, Jesus. So he sent them to experience Jesus. Um, and the way he did it, he said, you know, Jesus, the disciples said, are you the one? Or are we going to wait some more? Well, it sounds like it took whatever that waiting shaped up to be. It took. Because certainly some more disciples were formed from John the Baptist to Jesus. Here we are in the season of Advent, focusing on waiting and trying to lift up lots of different dimensions so that we can approach it from different angles and perspectives. In this book, which we've been focusing on, and guess what? We sold out and didn't sell out. We gave out 100. We've got 25 more. We, we, we've got one for you if you don't have it. This is our way here at St. James of focusing on this very, very important concept of waiting because the church tells us to do it, the calendar tells us to do it, St. James is telling us to do it. Let's do it. And in the focus for this week in this book, uh, the author talks about active waiting, which is not contemplative waiting, it's not contemplative, but it's doing things, participating in activities that lead us hopefully to that place where we can, in stillness and silence, wait on God. And, and these are the kinds of things that she talks about. She talks about giving back. I mean, think about it. When you give back to somebody, you're in a relationship, and it's a, it's hopefully there's a peace there, there's a connection, which might just lead to your sitting down and being with God. Um, she talks about acknowledging gratitude, you know, the old saying of an attitude of gratitude. This is the Eucharist, it's a thanksgiving, it's gratitude. That's the first step of so many ways to pray. She talks about taking one step at a time. Don't try to go the whole distance in 15 minutes, but taking baby steps towards really being with God in silence. She talked about learning something new. You know how exciting it is to learn something new. It might be not even religious, but you learn something new and we're, we're hardwired to learn new things. It gets us excited because we feel like we're more capable of taking other steps. She talks about getting into your body, of breathing, of relaxing. That leads us, that can lead us to that spiritual place. And she talks about envisioning what you want, what you want and where you want to go. That thing of lifting up a vision of where God might be leading you, your heart might be leading you, and just holding it out there and asking God, how am I going to get there? <coughs> well, this past week I came, came discovered another book. Actually, this was, this was on jo Joanne's shelf. And it's another good book about waiting. It's by Sue Monk Kidd. And um, it's called When the Heart Waits. And it's really not a, like a daily waiting, but it was, it's about a, a time in her life where things were rather dark. Things were dismal. It's sort of a midlife crisis kind of thing. And uh, she knew it was time to turn to God and to try something new. I want to read you what she says. 
As I returned, she's a, by the way, she's at a monastery on retreat. As I returned to the great to the guest quarters, I noticed a monk, ski cap pulled over his ear, sitting perfectly still beneath the tree. There was such reverence in his silhouette, such tranquil sturdiness, that I paused to watch. He was the picture of waiting. Later, I sought him out. I said, I saw you today sitting beneath the tree, just sitting there so still. How is it that you can wait so patiently in the moment? I can't seem to get used to the idea of doing nothing. He broke into a wonderful grin. Well, there's the problem right there, young lady. You bought into the cultural myth that when you're waiting, you're doing nothing. Then he took his hands and placed them on my shoulders, peered straight into my eyes and said, I hope you'll hear what I'm about to tell you. I hope you'll hear it all the way down to your toes. When you're waiting, you're not doing nothing. You're doing the most important something there is. You're allowing your soul to grow up. If you can't be still and wait, you can't become what God created you to be. Somehow I knew in my soul that his words were God's words. This is the season of Advent. This is the time when uh, we could uh, stomp our feet and say, stop, slow down, wait. Because there is something that God wants to tell each and every one of you now. And for a purpose. The purpose is so that we'll be in that place that we can really joyful, joyfully, even more joyfully celebrate the birth of Jesus. We will be in that place where we can be confident, even more confident that, that God is leading us. In this day and age, that is so important and such the key, such the key of life. Both Henry Now and Simone Wheel call waiting to be at the center of our spiritual lives. It's important. So please do it. Amen.